Hey, movie fans, and welcome back to another episode of the Uncharted Media Podcast. This is episode 96, so with Fandom right around the corner, oh, I'm so excited, um, <laughs> we figured we needed something DC-related, because, Josh, we don't talk about DC nearly enough on this channel. It's You know, yeah, no, I don't think we do. I, I think we could talk about it ju- just a little bit more, just, just a little bit more. That's indeed what we are doing today, um, as I'm obviously giving away. It's a Batman-related topic that we had to double and triple check to make sure we haven't done. We've done something similar to it. Uh, we've done top 10 Batman movies. Today, we're going to be doing top 10 individual, specific Batman moments uh, from the movies. Yes. Um, not comic book itself. That'd be way too hard to narrow it down. Um, our caveat yeah. on this is one moment per movie, and all movies involving Batman are fair game. Although, spoiler alert, I don't have anything from Lego Batman. But, um... Hold on, I have to double check. I didn't. I didn't just do multiple ones from the same movie. <laughs> ah, All right. Well, I did. Okay, so this is gonna be fun. <laughs> well, before we get into any of that, and before we get into into any of the news, Josh, how you doing tonight? I'm chilling, bro. Chilling like a villain. Uh, new Apex update came out today. I am rocking and rolling. Um, I introduced you to Fall Guys, which is, if y'all aren't playing Fall Guys, um, what are you playing? Because this is the game to play right now. Which, it's weird to say as grown, almost 30-year-old men that were playing games with really cute marshmallow bubbly characters trying to kill each other. Um, Yes. But Fall Guys, it's free on PlayStation right now, and it's so addicting it's I think it's going to be the next like big competitive game Um, because I'm not going to lie. Fall Guys has made me the most stressed I've ever been playing a game in a very long time because like it's there's different stages to it of like, oh, yeah, the first one's super easy to get by because you just have to be one of the first 40 people out of a 60 pool, 60 player pool. It doesn't seem so hard. And then it slowly keeps narrowing and narrowing down. So I got my first victory and it was just like rejoicing in the streets. And <laughs> Heather played it for a little bit. It's it's just a good time. So I've been I've been playing that. Um, but I've also been watching some stuff. But before I get into that, Josh, have you been watching anything good lately? I have. Uh, off mic, uh, you and I talked to a little bit about i watched empire strikes back today oh not today but like this week okay um, quick disclaimer on that when you texted me today saying you had just watched empire recently my first thought wasn't empire strikes back it was the terrence howard tv show on fox oh. <laughs> going <laughs> no that's an yeah. odd pick for empire. josh but everybody's got their own taste man <laughs> yeah i mean taste their own um no but uh we're continuing i mean it's been us taking our time with it of course but uh we watched a new hope a few weeks ago and we watched so now we're watching uh, empire we'll probably watch return of the jedi either this coming week or next week and just we're just keep we keep rolling through everything um also i haven't told you this because uh yeah i finished season one of agents of shield really (laughs) yeah and let me tell you, the first half of the season is total garbage. <laughs> um, but the second half is awesome. Okay. I never thought, never thought. And you know, you know me well enough to know that I was never on board with Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. I thought it was dumb. I thought it was a ex- stupid excuse to bring back Agent a- Coulson just for like a cash grab, basically. And... Dang, um, it's a good show, and I love Coulson now. I mean, I already loved Coulson, but like now I like. Everybody loves Coulson. I would die for Coulson. Everybody loves yeah. Coulson. Yeah, so um, I know I told you I was going to try to see Tax Collector this week, uh, but that's probably going to happen next week. Well, if at all, I watched something new too, and I have started my own new show too. Uh, this will be l- much less surprising to you, though. Um, so I watched the new Sonic movie. Because that was cheap oh, on yeah. Voodoo recently, so Heather and I watched it. Um, it was better than I expected, but it still wasn't great. It was fine. I'll mm-hmm. say this: of like, I'm glad it's getting a sequel so that I could spend more time in that world. Because I was kind of just eh, about 
the first one. Uh, there's a lot of good things to it. Overall, Heather and I liked it, but we both agreed that it was very generic and same of, okay, some of the jokes are pretty good, but we feel like we've seen this in other movies before. Um, although there's a lot of jokes on both of our parts of James Marsden is oddly specifically typecast as the guy that has to go on a mission with some furry sidekick. Yeah, that it's always weird. But overall, it wasn't... Um, but I'm glad it wasn't awful. It, well, yeah, it wasn't bad. Um, I'm glad to be getting a sequel. Yeah. So... I mean, that's I've seen I've seen the the uh, what's it called um, the end credit scene, so I'm not too surprised. Yeah. By things, but I was kind of hoping it'll be, it'll be fun. I was kind of hoping it would be um, Knuckles because I like Knuckles more than Tails, but whatever. Um, now the other thing I've been watching, Agreed. other thing I've been trying. I don't know why I never watched this sooner, but um, I've decided to try uh, Superman the animated series. Uh, that happened a few years after the original oh, really? Batman animated series. I grew up watching Batman animated series all the time. It's one of my favorite shows of all time. Um, we will be mentioning it later in our discussion for sure. Um, and I watched Justice League. I just never really got around to watching Superman the animated series. I wasn't a huge Superman fan as a kid. I I mean, he was fine. I had some Superman comics, but he wasn't like upper echelon like he is now for me. Um, I'm really liking it so far. Uh, I'm like four or five episodes in. I really like the origin that they've got down. Um, yeah, I've just been on a Superman kick. And again, since we'll be talking about DC fandom and our news uh, again, let's just say I, I think this will be justified revisiting Superman stuff because I, I just can't help but scratch that itch that I think something massively Superman related is on the horizon soon. Oh, I, I would agree. I wouldn't be surprised at all. Um, like, I mean, like our little tin foil hat sequence kind of suggested, uh, it's hard for it to not be a thing at this point. Because before it was like, oh, but he's got all these scheduling conflicts. Oh, I don't know. But now it's like, well, what else is he doing? Yeah, I think they're just saving him for a really big announcement. Uh, Josh, you watching yeah. anything else this week? Let's see. Empire... Uh, Seasons of Shield. Oh, no, not really. Honestly, I I haven't been had a lot of time to really watch a lot this week. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, so um, I will say I'm done with what I've been watching. Besides Fall Guys, I did play something. The oh yeah, uh, Avengers beta that dropped this weekend. Yes, you're supposed to tell me how that was. Yeah. So um. Oh boy, it's complicated to say the least. <laughs> it's real a lot. I've seen a lot of people rip this game to shreds already, and I don't think that's necessarily fair because, again, this is a beta. We're getting just a small little sliver of what the overall game is. As a whole, not necessarily that interested. Um, and here's why. Uh, I like the storytelling that they're going for. The very limited part of it that they have you actually going through the story mode, I don't mind. I thought the story was interesting. Um, my big complaint, though, is the combat. Combat's a big part of this game, and it feels, while I was playing it, this didn't feel like in a true Avengers um, game, so much as it felt like back in the day you had those movie tie-in video games. This felt like a movie tie-in game. Of, Ew. Yeah, it felt very samey of all right here's a room of generic bad guys punch them and button mash them for five to ten minutes all right do the same thing in the next room and the next room and there's all these different characters and i was kind of hoping that their play styles would differ a little bit um and there's some differences between like how iron man plays versus how hulk plays but i thought iron man played very similar to thor um it it doesn't they didn't feel necessarily the most unique in terms of their play style, but also it felt very monotonous in the combat of the great thing about the Arkham games or the Spider-Man games is there's this like fluidity. And also you can choose how you play. You can use a lot of gadgets, be a lot of hand to hand. You can mix up your play style to be more entertaining, get more um, depth out of the game. Whereas this one, it felt very much like, 
All right, press this for medium attack, press this for heavy attack over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. It didn't feel like there was a lot of variety there. But again, this is just a yeah. beta, so I don't feel like I can completely judge this movie for game for better or for worse. Um, but yeah, uh, it's not the worst, but it, if I had to sum it up, it felt like a movie tie-in game. That's... See, and that's what, uh, unfortunately, is I was nervous about. Because it's a great, like, doing an Avengers game, in my mind, is a great way to expand your roster. Show who who, can, who you could see in a movie. Like, we're talking Black Knight. We're talking Namor. I mean, Miss Marvel's a cool little... Uh, actually, she was addition. my favorite thing. That, she was my favorite thing about the game, because she plays differently, and good. she actually felt unique to everybody else. Good. But also, I think well, part like, of it was, good. I wasn't comparing her to anybody else. Fair. Okay. See, but like, that's what I think needed to happen with this. And from everything that I heard, this is the roster period. You're not getting, you're not, there's not going to be like, Oh, I can unlock other characters. Like, you can unlock <laughs> Spider-Man. Sorry, Xbox people. Sorry, buddy. Um, but yeah, like it doesn't, it doesn't seem like there's going to be much to this game other than, Ooh, I can make Captain America look different. And I don't want to play an Avengers game for that. You know? Yeah. I don't, I don't blame you for that. Well, so Josh, you ready to get into some news? Let's get into it. Um, speaking of news, did didn't we have something big to announce? I'm so glad you said something, Josh. Yes, I'm so glad you said something, Josh. Or else I would have completely forgot about this. And maybe I should have done like a special, special like a After Effects effect on this. But whatever. Um, what Josh is talking about is this is episode 96. Do the math. We are very, very close to episode 100, which is a hundred more episodes than I thought we would ever do of this show. Yeah. <laughs> so. Oh, absolutely. Um, I never would have dreamed we would have come this far, dude. Because I remember when we first started, we were like, well, we miss talking to each other all the time about movies. So let's do something where we can, I don't know. Do that. Do you talk about movies? Because we're two white dudes, so what do we do? We just do a podcast. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Which, in our defense, in our defense, we did this long before quarantined. So, yeah. all y'all that just started doing it during quarantine, we did it before you. Just still ten years before it was popular, but um, ten years after it was popular. <laughs> I mean, um, but we have a big announcement in regards to the hundredth episode. Starting with the 100th episode, we will be debuting the Uncharted Media Podcast live. For now, we will be on Facebook, and then we might transition to YouTube. But for the time being, starting with the 100th episode, you can join us as we record every... Um, well, the night will be up in the air, uh, but every time we're going live for the Uncharted Media Podcast, you can watch us live on Facebook, and then the full video will be posted on YouTube uh, the next day, but you can interact with us during the show, ask questions, interact with us. We will be going live, and we may have a surprise or two in store for that 100th episode, and even more announcements. Let's just say we're really, really ramping things up in a big way for not just Uncharted Media Podcast, but just Uncharted Media in general, so much so that we needed to get extra hardware for everything that we got ready for you guys, and it glows. Um, <laughs> where Josh? Yeah, dude. I mean, it's exciting because it's like I, you and I have always had a passion for this kind of thing, and it's like like I've like a my statement has always been: this is at its core just two guys who love movies, and from that. We're going to just expand. We're going to be do some really, really cool stuff. It's actually really hard for me to not say anything, but we're excited about it. Uh, we're going to do some really cool, fun stuff for, for the 100th episode. Um, and just to be clear, the uh, – the because we're going live doesn't mean if you miss the live broadcast – that you're missing the podcast entirely that from my understanding we are we are still going to send it to the youtube send it to the to the spotify or wherever else you have been listening to us we're just giving you that opportunity to 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 not only see us live but also to interact with us live yes josh you're spot on um you, 
it's just different now of it gives you guys more chances to interact with us to share with other movie fans that you think might enjoy our content um but just kind of helps us interact with us more uh lets you guys interact with us more just a live atmosphere makes it a little different but also knowing us my computer or something's gonna go on fire that night just because <laughs> it's this is how it goes every single time with a podcast I or Josh have a really good idea and we implement it on the show and it takes about a week or two for all of the uh, the problems to be ironed out. Um, then it goes smoothly. Just never on the first try. First try. Uh, but yes, we will be going live. <laughs> we will be reminding you each week leading up to the 100th. This is episode 96. Remember that. So I believe it is the 14th. Tentatively put that on your calendar. The week of the 14th, Uncharted Media Podcast will be going live from every episode then on out. But you'll still be able to catch us um, on YouTube. We'll upload the whole show from there if you missed it. Uh, it'll be on Facebook. Uh, and we'll still have a regular podcast audio stream going to all of our regular sources. Google Podcasts, iTunes, um, whatever else you listen to us on. So without further ado... Let's get into some news topics. Absolutely. Because first up, Netflix strikes again. Um, <laughs> however, this time I'm, I'm going to at least partially play devil's advocate with this in that mm -hmm. I can see it from both sides of what they mean. So what I'm talking about here is... Netflix is developing a live action Avatar The Last Airbender and they had brought on the original show creators. Uh two guys who whose names are really hard to pronounce. I'm not even gonna try and try it. Um they were responsible <laughs> for the last airbender TV show, not the movie. Um the TV show and Legend of Korra. Well, after two years of silence, basically, we now know why we haven't heard any updates. And it is because those two guys have now left the project due to creative differences. And all the red flags in the world are being raised. Um, but I'm going to I'm going to try and play both sides on this. But, Josh, you hear initially that Avatar The Last Airbender has the live action series has lost its two original creators for this Netflix adaptation. Is there any one party in particular that you're pointing a finger at? I mean, yes, initially it's all, it's very easy, especially with the, the love that avatar and Cora both have. Um, it's hard to not be like, well, Netflix screwed up. That's all Netflix's fault. Um, but I mean, it's loved now, but when Cora was coming out... Oh, no, Cora's not, not loved, man. Cora is not loved. Mm, see, okay, maybe it's it's certain crowds. Yeah, maybe certain not. crowds. Cora like, did not have the reception that enjoyed, Avatar did. But not, yeah, it is, not, it is enjoyed, but it's not near as enjoyed or loved as much as the original series. Um, it has some great moments. It did some fun, interesting new things with that universe. Um, but it... And to their credit, it's hard to follow Avatar Last Airbender. So it, it, uh, I can't really fault them for not being able to follow it. With that being said, who's to say that's not the luck that they were going to have with Netflix? You know what I mean? So I come at this from two different sides. My immediate – I'm a huge Avatar fan. My initial gut reaction is to go, this is a horrible thing on Netflix's part. Um, how could you let these two guys go? Um, they created one of the best shows of all time with Avatar The Last Airbender, but also in the back of my mind, I'm going, well, they also did create Legend of Korra, which isn't nearly as good. Um, but also, and this is where some people are not going to be happy, these guys are good, but they've never done anything live action before. And live action is different True. than animation. And... I think maybe they're too close to the project emotionally and rightly so they created it. Um, but maybe it's those, one of those things of Netflix wanted to change something minor, but they're so protective of their property cause they created it that they're like, ah, I don't know. We really want this. Um, it could be that, but also on the flip side in their defense, it could be Netflix and Netflix has a great track record with adult shows 
Netflix's movies are terrible, but Netflix does really good shows. But I don't know of any standout children's shows on Netflix. Um, then again, I'm not the target demographic, so I don't know. If anybody knows any outstanding original content that Netflix has for kids, let me know. Because, yeah. well, so, I maybe? Think, see, that's that would be the, the question then, is if you make a live-action Avatar Last Airbender, is your target audience kids? Or is it the the people that grew up with the TV show? I think it should be kids. It should be kids. Okay. Well, either way. Um, and in some ways, too, they deserve to be defensive after what happened with M. Night Shyamalan. So I can kind of see some apprehensions on their side. But you're not wrong. They haven't done anything live action. So who knows, man? I mean, half the stuff that Netflix announced never get, actually gets made anyway. Yeah. So. Um. Maybe this is a situation of Netflix wanted it to be more akin to Stranger Things because, as we know, they're desperately trying to find their next big hit TV show. And I'm just going, well, maybe if you stop canceling stuff after three or four seasons, you'd find one that's stuck. Um, but Netflix can't afford to pay anything for more than three or four seasons. Um, so I could see both sides to this. Um, it just sucks. I, I think in the end, I think this does suck. But this doesn't necessarily mean the end for the Avatar show on Netflix. It could still theoretically be good. And they, the creators themselves even said so in their press release saying, this show still has the potential to be good. It's just we're not involved with any anymore. So um, and I said earlier that I think the show should be targeted for kids. I think a big problem with fandom nowadays, not just Avatar, but every fandom in general, there's a lot of stuff that was initially intended for kids that people – grew up with and now watch as adults that want them want the show to grow up with them and not admit that they still like something that's for children it's okay to like something that are made for kids ninja turtles is made for kids you don't have to justify why you like it in your early to mid 30s it's okay to still like that but don't expect ninja turtles content or avatar content to now be made exclusively for 30 to 35 year olds. It's going to alienate future generations enjoyment. I think star Wars is a big proponent of that right now of, I grew up with the original trilogy. So the prequels are terrible. Well, the original star Wars is made for kids. The prequels are made for kids. And now you have a whole bunch of kids that love the prequels because they grew up with it. It targeting something specifically for adults, I think is always a problem, but also adults trying to defend the fact that they still like, what they might consider to be childish things also can be very, very dangerous. This is yeah. my weird pedestal yeah. moment. Yeah, no, I, I'd agree. Um, I think it, the, you could even argue that I think maybe that's why um, people didn't gravitate to Korra as much. While it's not as good of a show, I think you could make the argument that uh, people were expecting the homegrown nostalgia, nostalgia that they got and the good, the, the same show that at Last Airbender was. You know what I mean? They felt like it was supposed to be that show, but grow, uh, you know, at a different time period. And that's not what Korra is. Korra is definitely a different show completely. Um, I will say I think doing live action for Avatar Last, Last Airbender – I think that would adhere it more to to your. I'm going to do large air quotes here, adult audience, but uh, it, at its core, it does need to be a quote unquote children's it's show. It's about kids because while Avatar Last uh, Avatar Last Airbender was a, a children's show, it dealt with some really tough stuff. So it's it'd be hard to balance that and be like that's a kids show. Well, there's you know a lot I mean? of kids shows that deal with hard things, but at the end of the day, they're still mainly targeted for kids. Like, don't get me wrong. I think some of the greatest animated kids shows, of, greatest shows of all time are still kids shows, but they can be viewed by any audience. Like, Young Justice, I still to this day consider to be a masterpiece, but that's a kids show. But that also might, now that I think about it, Young Justice might be the perfect example of growing your audience, growing your show up with your audience because 
the content that we got in season one of Young Justice is far and away different from the content that we get in Young Justice season three, Outsiders. Um, it's much more intense, I'd say, while still going from kid show to young adult show. And maybe that's something Netflix might think about for Avatar. Not necessarily kids, but don't go full Stranger Things with it. But Stranger Things can be enjoyed by a wide demographic. It doesn't have a set demographic of this is who it's supposed to be for. Um, But it revolves around kids and could more or less be a kid show, I guess. But I don't know. There's a lot of complicated stuff with it. Yeah. At the end of the day, it's going to be a complicated demographic. And I think at this point, it would be better to focus more on making it a good adaptation then I would be like, well, is this going to be for kids or for young adults or for adults? Like, it'd be, I think it's more important to make it an accurate de- uh, adaptation than it is to hit your demographic. You yeah, I, mean? I don't need it to be 100% faithful. It can do its own thing. Just yeah. be good story. Hey, movie fans, quick interruption real quick before we get into our ne- next news topic. We've had some technical issues Uh, for this episode so for the rest of the news segment it'll just be me josh and i had recorded but some funky stuff happened but we still wanted to get this episode out to you don't worry everything with the discussion is still here um so josh will be back for the discussion you'll hear him in just a bit but for the rest of the news segment i'm just gonna briefly run through it all for you guys all right so uh next up we had stuff that kind of hurts i'll be honest um but it doesn't come as any shock to me and that seems like um disney has abandoned physically physical media yet again so what i mean by that is it seems like now disney has denied these reports but doesn't i don't buy that it's that um they're ceasing production on all 4k discs that are not main disney titles star wars marvel or pixar now um you might say why is this significant well that's anything from like 20th century fox any of their mainly 20th century fox but any of their other subsidiaries will no longer be getting any 4k support um i know 4k is a dying medium but i don't care because I still believe that that is the best way to watch a movie at home is physically owning a movie and internet is not at that point yet. Um, Internet is not at a point where it's consistently better than a disc. You can stream something that's totally fine, but the quality that you get from a stream is still nowhere near as close to the quality of watching it physically on a disc that you put into your system i know 4ks didn't really take off i still don't use them because i still prefer to watch everything in the best possible quality that i can i don't understand the rationale of this decision at all there's still a lot of options still on the table money wise and i know this is a money decision because you're just probably looking at this going well, 4Ks are making less and less money every year, so let's just cut production to them where I'm going. But there's still a lot of titles that people want to see 4K remasters for, like um, a movie that's close to near and dear to both Josh Nice Hearts, uh, Fight Club. That will, if this is true, that'll never get a 4K restoration. Or Aliens, both of which are fantastic. Um,. I know this is a money decision, just straight up from Disney's perspective, uh, but it's another one of those I don't get it decisions from Chapek, and I I don't know when his tenure is done, but I'm already counting down the days till it ends, just because there's so many decisions that he's made and will continue to make that I am again so against um because financially the disney company will be just fine but it will be creatively bankrupt and it'll push a lot of people away and you're already starting to see that and i may be blowing this out of proportion as a i will cling to my physical media till the day i die but i i don't know it just seems like shifting everything too much to disney plus too quickly for movies that probably won't even end up Movies that won't even end up on Disney Plus. Like you telling me Fight Club is going to be on Disney Plus. Not going to lie, that would be pretty awesome. But 
there's no way that's going to happen. If anything, it'll probably end up on Hulu, but I, I don't know. I don't think this was a very wise decision. Um, but again, Disney has denied these, but Disney's denied things in the past. So um, I don't want to say goodbye to physical media, but I will be happy to say hello to the theater going experience again, because it seems like this week um, movie theaters will be open again. Now, some theaters near me have been open um, like one or two, but they've just been showing old theaters. Well, now it seems like some of the other major chains like AMC and Regal will be open this week, um, either the 20th or the 21st. And AMC is offering a really sweet deal. AMC is offering for just this Thursday, the opening day that they're back, all tickets are 15 cents of the, the same price when AMC first opened um, way back in the 20s. I think that's really, really cool. Um, I'm really excited to have theaters back. Um, I went once during this pandemic, and I actually felt really, really safe with the procedures that my local theater had used. Um, it's one of the few theaters, though, that was already like well-equipped for the virus before the virus even hit because they're like really spaced out seats you don't see anybody in any other rows just because of how it's structured it's really really nice um but heather and i saw indiana jones it was awesome the thing is we've seen indiana jones before it's wonderful it's a different experience seeing in theaters but with theaters opening it means on the horizon is new things and i desperately want new things because like the theaters near me they're showing stuff different things each weekend but there's stuff i've seen before like this past weekend the theater universal city walk had all eight harry potter movies i'm going that's awesome but i've seen all eight of you on opening night before and just eh, okay sure um but i want new things like new mutants is right around the corner bill and ted i think is going to be open in some select theaters and i will track you down bill and ted i will support you and watch you in theaters because I want to be excellent to you, as you have been excellent to each other. Um, and then after that, we've got Tenant. Fingers crossed on Tenant again. I feel like that's been most of the movies this year. Fingers crossed, we might get it. Um, we might Tenant. Sorry, that was real bad. Um, it's just a prospect of new movies again, please. Um, now, I don't know why it's taken movies so long to open. It's probably because there's been nothing open, because... In my eyes, I think it's easier to control a movie theater in terms of social distance than a lot of other things, like maybe a grocery store or a theme park. Like, you can assign people seats and space them out. You can control the numbers. I would think that's easier, but maybe it has to do with people showing up for, like, new releases or whatever. So, we'll see. I'm... <laughs> I have missed the theater so, so much, so I'm happy to have it back, um primarily with new releases more than anything else, but um, I'm also excited because supposedly, fingers crossed, uh, Universal will be showing some old school horror movies for the Halloween season for their like comeback classics, so my fingers crossed for like some old Universal monsters, like maybe some Invisible Man, because <laughs> last year I saw Halloween, that was outstanding, and while I've been saying I want some new stuff... I don't mind that the old stuff's there. I just want different variety, if you know what I mean. Um, so, next up, we've got an interesting one. Space Jam 2. Now, Josh and I, obviously, we have our thoughts about this. I think I'm a little more proactive on this movie than Josh is, who really has no love for this movie project however i will say i am disappointed that we missed the audio we missed the video got all jumbled up and weird for the new segment that's why i'm here to kind of do a reshoot of this um because in the original version of this josh came to the sudden and life-altering realization that toon squad is spelled t-u-n-e and he thought that this movie changed the spelling. But I told him it has always been spelled that way with the meme of the astronauts. It's always been that way. <laughs> and that just blew his mind. Um, we bring up Space Jam 2 and the Toon Squad because we now have our first official look at the jerseys that they're wearing at Space Jam 2. Hmm. 
uh, I'm kind of, I don't know how to think of this. I'm kind of mixed. So, like, I'll be honest. I don't, I really don't know what to think of this. I will say, though, that the original Space Jam jerseys felt very of their time. Very 90s, very what not Michael Jordan and other NBA players would wear at the time. These jerseys feel like something current NBA players would wear in terms of the color scheme or the design. I actually am in favor of it not being the exact same Toon Squad jersey. Um, it would continue to be that whole, well, we're just rebooting this because I think this movie will stand on its own more than that. Um, also, I like liked but didn't love this movie as a kid. Like I didn't watch it a ton. Where's all this like nostalgia goggles for this movie? Like I never have understood this because take the nostalgia goggles off. Space Jam as a movie is really nothing special. It's really not that great. And do no small part to Michael Jordan is the greatest basketball player of all time. He is a terrible, terrible actor. Like, bad across the board. Larry Bird is a better actor in that movie than Michael Jordan. So in that regard, I think I'm a little more excited for this because we've seen LeBron James and stuff. And he can act. He's actually got a really good sense of humor, good timing, good acting. I would like to see him act in more stuff when he's done playing basketball. Um, I think he's up there in terms of athletes that are actually really good actors. Uh, but him, Peyton Manning, for better or for worse, you have to put OJ up there. Um, I will count Andre the Giant as an actor. Thank you very much. Um so in that regard, we can debate all day if Michael Jordan's better or LeBron's better. In terms of acting, it's not even close. LeBron is a better actor. Now, Josh has brought up this point before, and I completely agree, of when the original Space Jam came out, the Looney Tunes were really, really popular. You still had like three or four different shows running at that time. Um, Animaniacs was kind of similar, like in that same realm. I always kind of lump Animaniacs with Looney Tunes, but you had Animaniacs, you had the original Looney Tunes rerun still on, you had, um, there's like a baby Looney Tunes. Nowadays, I don't think kids necessarily really know Looney Tunes particularly well. It's not in the cultural consciousness as much. People and kids might know or have heard of Space Jam, but, like, the, orig the reason why the big one, the original one was such a big hit, I think, even if it didn't really register with me, was the meeting of two worlds. Michael Jordan and his greed and Looney Tunes, two big things from the 90s. Right now, LeBron's a big thing. I don't know if I can think of anything off the top of my head that would really match that in terms of a crossover. Um, but, yeah, I don't know. I'm still on the fence about this movie. I I don't know how I feel about the jerseys, but I like the fact that it's a different jersey. And I, I will remain cautiously optimistic because I don't have an attachment to the original. Um, just because I saw it a few times, I think. But there's nothing really that fancy about it. It's, it's one of those that I still to this day do not understand. There's such loyal blind devotion to space jam like there's almost like this cult like it is one of my favorite childhood movies it's it's it's, it's a movie we'll say that um so last but not least the fun one so dc fandom is this saturday and i cannot wait i've been watching all my dc stuff this week well that's not a whole lot different from any other week unfortunately um but DC Fandom is this week, and they have released the schedule for what projects we can expect to see. And I'm not going to lie, I've got pretty excited. So, let's go over this list together, shall we? At These are all Eastern time, so do your own math forever you listen to us or wherever you're at, because I'm Eastern time. Um, starting at 1 o'clock on Saturday... Wonder Woman 1984 panel. It's about 25 minutes, and the filmmakers 
filmmaker Patty Jenkins and the cast will be more or less talking about the new Wonder Woman. And I also expect a new trailer to come out of that. Um, and out of that trailer, here's one of my bold predictions. I've got a couple for fandom this weekend. I think that not only will we get a Wonder Woman trailer, in this trailer, we will finally get our first official look at Kristen Wiig as Cheetah. Because they've really been playing that one close to the chest. And we know she's in the film as probably like the secondary antagonist behind Pedro Pascal. Um, I think this will be the time. It won't be a very long shot, but maybe just a quick shot of this is Cheetah in final form type of thing. And this this could be a fun one. I think this is one of the longer panels. I've seen a lot of people complain that these panels are really, really short. And I, I agree that they are pretty short. Um, the longest ones are... 25 to 30 minutes and the rest of them are about 10 to 15 minutes but in dc fandom's defense a lot of the ones that are shorter like 10 to 15 minutes are ones that are really really early in pre-production or haven't even started filming yet so they probably it's like the line from phantom menace we will report him something when we have something to report it's like they have a panel but they might not necessarily have that much to say yet so We'll see. Um, plus, I'm not going to lie. I kind of think at times some panels kind of drag on just to meet a certain time quota. So without that, I think, yeah, sure, they could just pack in as much information as they want in that little spread of time. Um, so after the Wonder Woman panel, we've got the Warner Brothers Games Montreal announcement at 1.30. So this one I'm paying very close attention to because uh, Warner Brothers Montreal has been teasing all all this week of different announcements that we're getting um, for this game. Now, it's like the worst kept secret in not just video games, but also comic books that this game is a Batman game um, that's been in development for what seems like years now. Um, and it's rumored to be the entire Bat family versus the Court of Owls, to which I will speak my, for myself and Josh. Yes, just yes. Bring us more Court of Owls stuff, please, 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 because Court of Owls are the best. Um, so I have that circled, underlined, highlighted, whatever, because I need more Batman games, because I played the Avengers game this weekend, and it made me miss the Arkham games a lot. Um, so after that, we have a Multiverse 101 panel at 2.20 Eastern, kind of explaining what a multiverse is and kind of getting the casual people up to speed. However, I find this interesting, that that's at 2.20, but at 2.45, we have Introducing the Flash. So we have a multiverse panel right before the Flash. It's almost like they're piggybacking off of one, one another because we've heard talk for a while that the Flash movie will introduce the concept of the multiverse into the DCEU, where Flash will go back in time to save his mother and discover the multiverse and that's how we introduce michael keaton's batman into the dceu another bold prediction i think michael keaton's batman will show up for this flash panel and i'm still on record saying i'm not a huge fan of ezra miller um as flash but um we haven't seen his actual performance in the Zack snyder cut but it's still that whole assaulting a woman thing it's there's been no remark on that, so maybe this is the platform that Ezra can clear the air and finally apologize or address the situation. I don't know if they will. I doubt they will. I hope. I think Warner Bros. is hoping we forget about it, but we won't because it's an awkward thing just lingering in the air. Just address this, nip this in the butt, get it over with, um, and then we can move on. But, uh, yeah, the Flash thing is just awkward for me. Um, but from there... We've got at 255 Beyond Batman, so that's probably just going to be a generic Batman announcement. Then at 3 o'clock, one of the major ones, we have The Suicide Squad by James Gunn. I would be willing to bet the house that we get some form of a teaser trailer here because unlike The Batman, which we'll get to that in a second, um, The Suicide Squad actually finished filming before covid hit they finished everything whereas the batman got i think maybe 30 40 percent of it finished so i think we'll finally get some character details maybe some posters 
But more importantly, I think we're getting an actual trailer for the Suicide Squad at Fandom. Uh, I think that'll be a lot of fun. I think this could be probably the most entertaining panel of all of them just because it's James Gunn and the whole cast there of a whole bunch of wacky people. So from then, uh, we have Legacy of the Bat. That's at 410. I think that's a whatever. We have a Chris Daughtry performance at 430. I like Daughtry, but I just think this is an odd placement on this. Maybe he talked to his friend Jim Lee. Um, we have a surprise DC Comics panel at 5 o'clock. Now, I don't think this is the major one because um, this says surprise DC Comics panel. So I think this announcement will be specifically comic related. However, I still have my eye on this one just in case because anytime it says surprise i just go hmm um however i don't think that's the major surprise of the night but we'll get to that in a second um so at 5 45 probably the biggest panel of the night the snyder cut panel this is also 25 minutes just like the wonder woman panel and this is where we're getting the first real trailer for the snyder cut of justice league um I've slowly been coming around to this movie the more I'm hearing about the production of the Joss Whedon cut. Don't get me wrong. I actually like the Joss Whedon version of Justice League, but I'm willing to see Zack Snyder's vision completed um, more than anything else just because I can tell he's got a passion for it. I may not have been the biggest fan of his direction. Uh, I still really like most of Man of Steel. I hated Batman vs. Superman, though, but... I still will give him the benefit of the doubt because I think even the best directors have um, bad days at the office. So maybe Batman vs. Superman was his bad day at the office and it just didn't work for me. Maybe Snyder Cut will be great. I'm willing to give it the benefit of the doubt. So I'm very curious, like a lot of other people, about the Snyder Cut. And I'll be curious to see what is unveiled at this panel. Um at th- with this full trailer, maybe we'll get some dialogue from Darkseid. But again, Darkseid is not the main villain. I think people seem to think that like the whole movie's different. Steppenwolf is still the villain. Darkseid plays a very minimal role in this. But maybe we get like a tease of Martian Manhunter, Green Lantern, like Zack Snyder has been hyping up for so long. But again, I I don't know about that either. Um, so we'll see. I think this is this one's going to be the most that the panel that reveals the most because. Um, unlike everything except for Wonder Woman, this is actually done already. It's been edited, everything else. The only thing that's different is it just needs to finish its visual effects. This has been shot before everything else. It just needs to be, like, polished up and finished, more or less. From there, we've got a panel that I think a lot of people are sleeping on. And that's at 610, the Black Adam panel. And The Rock is confirmed to be there. So... I think a lot of people, myself included, have been pretty hesitant on a Black Adam movie just because um, it's it's been in development for so long. I can't get excited for it just because, oh, it's happening, it's happening, and then it never actually happens. But also, Black Adam isn't a character that I particularly care about. I mean, I'm indifferent to him. I don't love him. I don't hate him. I like Shazam a lot more. Um, and also, I've been always against this movie just from the standpoint of the Black Adam that I know is a villain, not an anti-hero. And The Rock doesn't really do villains. He always has to be the good guy. So I'm sure The Rock will rock it up. Um, but I'm at least curious. I think this will be interesting because The Black Adam was supposed to get started filming soon, after, right before the pandemic hit. So I think it will. Um, I think they'll announce that they're filming in about a month or so. And they'll announce some casting and maybe even some potential characters. Bold prediction, I wouldn't be surprised if they officially announced some members of the Justice Society showing up in this movie like Hawkman or Hawkgirl or even Dr. Fate. I don't know if we'll go full Jay Garrick and um, Sandman like old school, but not completely old school, like the original generation of superheroes. I think we're going older timeline like Condock. So any characters that could have been around at that time, like Dr. Fate, Hawkman, I think they might actually get announced at Black Adam, at this Black Adam panel. So keep an eye out. We never know. Now, here it is. The big one. At 6.50, there is a panel saying 
to be announced. What do I think that is? Dun 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 dun. Dun 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 dun. I've said it last week. I'll say it again with my proud tinfoil hat on. This is Henry Cavill Superman related. Mark my words. This is a Superman related announcement of some kind with my tinfoil hat on. I don't even care. Call me a conspiracy theorist, but I think the evidence lines up with this. Um, because are you telling me that Henry Cavill, the man who was there when the Snyder Cut was announced, won't have any involvement in this entire DC fandom? I think this entire DC fandom event was created just for the Henry Cavill announcement of Superman. Because if you're teasing some major announcements, you have to have some announcements that the general casual movie going audience will care about. If you say like, we're making a Zatanna movie, some of us, myself included, we think that's awesome. Whereas a lot of people are going to be going, Who's Zatanna and why should I care? Like, that's not going to generate buzz. You know what generates buzz? Superman coming back, played by Henry Cavill himself. I think this is a Superman announcement. Either he will be coming back to be in a cameo role in either Black Adam, Shazam 2, uh, Aquaman, some future project, or the one that I'm going out on a limb and predicting. I'm sticking on my horse that I've been on for weeks now. I think they're announcing a new Superman movie at DC Fandom with Henry Cavill. I think this was the whole point of Fandom was just to drum up excitement for this one big announcement. This is the big haymaker that they're unloading. Yes, they're unloading a whole bunch of other DC related news, but this is the major one that I think they've kept us pretty close to the chest. I don't think a lot of news sites are reporting it, so maybe it's not even happening. Maybe it's just a fan's hope. I genuinely believe that that's what's happening this weekend. It's either Henry Cavill is being announced to come back in other people's movies, or he's being announced to come back in his full-fledged movie. Um, That's my tinfoil hat conspiracy theory, but I'm sticking with it. I don't think I'm that far off on this. So, back to your regularly scheduled jargon and no crazy people talk. Well... No more than usual. At 7 o'clock, we have an Aquaman panel. This one, I don't expect a ton from, just because Aquaman 2 is still a long way off. Maybe some slight details from James Wan. Um, I don't think it's going to be like a Black Adam thing where there's going to be a whole bunch of hidden details in this. Um, but who knows? I could be wrong on that. Um, then at 7.35, we got a Shazam panel. If Henry Cavill doesn't show up for the To Be Announced panel expect to see him for this one i would be willing to bet good money that superman shows up in some capacity in shazam 2 after he got set up in the first shazam so just like black adam i think shazam's panel could have some surprises like major surprises and probably announce that they're going to be filming soon because unlike some other uh movies that dc's working on Shazam has the most of a time crunch just because those kids grow up fast. Ask Stranger Things about that. Um, So they got to finish filming. They've got to start and finish filming this soon so those kids stay relatively kid like in this. Um, So I think Shazam could have a lot of big announcements. Then at 810, I always mess this up. Suicide Squad Kill the Justice League, the newest game. From Rocksteady, the people that brought us the Arkham Trilogy of Asylum City and Night. Now, this game supposedly has been in development for years. It was, at one point, a Superman game. Then that got scrapped. Then there was talk of it was a Damian Wayne game. But apparently not. It's a Suicide Squad game, as the Suicide Squad will be killing the Justice League, I guess. We'll be getting details about this. They Rocksteady hasn't been teasing this like uh, Warner Bros. Montreal has been, but... I'm at least curious about this. Um, a Suicide Squad game wasn't primarily at the top of my list for desires for um, for a Rocksteady game, but I have faith in them off the three Arkham games that it could be at least fun, so we shall see what they will announce. Probably a full trailer, if nothing else. 
And then the big one, the big panel besides the Snyder Cut, is at 8.30 for The Batman. So uh, we'll have Robert Pattinson, Matt Reeves, more or less the most of the crew there to discuss the film. I think we're going to get several big announcements. I wouldn't be surprised if we get a 30-second teaser trailer, um, even though they still have a lot of filming left to go. If they at least have something, maybe even if it's a head-to-toe like clear shot of Pattinson in the suit, maybe some character posters for like um, Catwoman or Penguin, see what people actually look like in the suit. Um, my big predictions, though, for this are that in their teaser, we'll finally get to hear the new Batman theme in its entirety. We heard a little snippet of it um, in that first screen test for Robert Pattinson with the red light and everything. I think we'll get our actual first look and listen, I mean, of the new Batman theme in its entirety. And my other one, just because it's it's me and I have to go out on a limb, I don't think we'll get any official details, but I think Matt Reeves will confirm the presence of Dick Grayson in this, in some capacity, um, that might be teased down the line. Now, that's my mo. I think that one's even more far fetched than my Superman one, but I don't care. That's just a fan's hope. Um, so yeah, I think there's going to be a lot of exciting things that happen with DC fandom this week, um, and I'm beyond excited to see what we're going to get. I think there's going to be a lot of fun, exciting. Um, announcements and a lot of big surprises that we don't even know about yet so in honor of dc fandom this week uh we figured let's talk about our one of our favorite comic book characters of all time i don't know if he still is my favorite anymore just because depending on my mood that day uh batman nightwing superman or spider-man kind of take that top spot it's all very uh, very close race in that mount rushmore for me but There's no doubt that Batman is still one of the best of all time. And I will say that he's had the best luck when it comes to movies. However, we've already done top 10 best Batman movies. But we haven't done top 10 best Batman movie moments. Because there might be some Batman movies that may not be necessarily the best. However, they have some of the best Batman moments in just personifying the characteristics of Batman. Or just might might be one-offs in lackluster movies, but excellent moments individually for batman so any batman movie is fair game for this live action animated lego um all of it's fair game because we're only allowed to use one movie per entry Mm. so you can't Mm -hmm. just be like everything from batman and robin is excellent and in the top 10 ever obviously that's just hyperbole although i might have a batman and robin scene on my list um Um, so yes, Josh, you want to kick us off? What is your number 10 best Batman movie moment? So weirdly enough, I know that normally when we do lists, mine are always all over the place. I always give the caveat, Hey man, these are in no particular order. That's not the case. These are legitimately top 10. Like I have put these in order of what I enjoy. Like it's yeah. So my number 10 comes from a little movie that I know not a lot of people have seen in Justice League War. I it, like that one. I love that one, but not a lot of people have seen it. Um, so here's the thing. Um, you can look up the clip because it's fantastic. But in, in early on, in the, yeah, I would say first 10, 15, maybe 30 minutes of the film, uh, Green Lantern and Batman happen to be down in the sewers. Oh, and I know Green Lantern starts questioning starts questioning Batman about his powers, and at one point, Batman uh, Green Lantern asks, "Is like, wait, you're not just some rich guy in a, in a dressed up as a bat, as he, are you?" And he turns around and kind of smirks, and then has Green Lantern's ring in his hand, and he's like, "How does this work?" <laughs> it's so great. <laughs> so, uh, Justice League War, I actually. It's not one of my favorites, but it's up there in terms of I really like it primarily because I kind of actually have an emotional connection to it because yeah. um, when I was I got really big into comics my high sc- my senior year of high school going forward and really fostered a love of comics in college and so when I was dating Heather at the time the first comic book she ever bought me was Justice League Origin uh, from the New Fifty Two 
So the first issue, the first book of the New 52 with the Justice League, which is more or less what Justice League War is exactly based off of, except yeah. swap out Aquaman for Cyborg and Shazam. Um, so when I finally see Justice League War, it was really, really cool to see that book come to life. Now, yeah. New 52 is not everyone's cup of tea. Looking back on it, I'm not even the biggest New 52 fan, but I do thank the new 52 for really getting me into comics which i know was their whole initiative with the new 52 and what their whole initiative is with 5g if that's still going forward i hope it's not um new 52 is still a really mixed bag there's a lot of good stuff if you're a batman fan it's bad for everybody else but i still liked that first incarnation of justice league from that story that heather got me and that translated really well to that movie um I really like Justice League War. It doesn't it's not on my list for moments, but I can think of a couple Batman moments. Um, Batman and Green Lantern both have some really good moments together in that. Have some really good chemistry. Yeah. I just wanted um, to definitely point that specific moment out because it is a moment that Batman doesn't get often in that he gets to be kind of funny and kind of clever. I mean, he's a smart guy, so it would make sense, but it's it definitely starts to build the the dynamic of Hal and, and Bruce, which I really, really enjoy. Um, you mentioning Batman being funny actually makes me want to throw out a quick honorable mention that I completely forgot, but I don't think it would have made my top 10 anyway, is one of the more underrated ones, uh, Justice League Crisis on Two Earths. And basically mm. they f- fight the crime syndicate from a different dimension. And... Um, something is coming to Earth or something, and Superman's like, maybe if I move the Earth out of the way or oh, yeah. the sun out of the way, and Superman just completely deadpan goes, we don't have two weeks for me to tell you how many reasons why that's a stupid idea. And I'm just going, <laughs> <laughs> Batman straight savage, because I see that meme every once in a while. I'm like, people, do you even know what that's from? Because if you don't, watch it, because that's one of the really, really underrated ones. Mm-hmm. Um, but speaking of underrated, that also transitions me perfectly into my number 10 from... I would say the most underrated Batman one, but it has to be pretty high on the list to the point of, I don't know if you've seen this one, Josh, uh, Batman Gotham Knight. Oh, I have. It's been a long, long time, but I've, I have seen it, but it, I've saw, I saw it like once and I haven't really seen it again. So <laughs> it's, I think it's very underappreciated. So what Gotham Knight is, it's very different than other Batman stories in that it's, I think it's either five or six short stories mm-hmm. about Batman from different people's perspective. But the nice thing is each story, it was directed by somebody. They've got different art styles. So it all feels like people's individual voices. However, it's still voiced by Kevin Conroy for each of them to kind of hold that cohesion together. You've got one that feels more like an anime, one that feels like a traditional uh, action movie. But there's one in particular that it's... Um, I think it's Renee Montoya and her partner are trying to bust some drug dealers or something, or they're tasked with protecting a drug dealer or something. And they get caught in the crossfire of two gangs firing at each other. So they're basically trapped between two rival gangs shooting each other. They've got nowhere to go. And Batman comes and bails them out. And there's like this big fire or whatever else, and Batman just stands in the fire interrogating one of the mob bosses like a boss, like completely unfazed by the fire, just going, he is fear incarnate. Nothing terrifies him, except losing a sidekick. Um, It was just one of those, okay, there's more style than substance here, but when the substance is Batman walking through fire being awesome, it's pretty good style right there. Um, Yeah, it is. Gotham Knight has a lot of really cool moments. Uh, Batman fighting Deadshot. Uh, it's a very stylized movie. It, it's very different, but it's still really, really awesome. Um, now, my... I don't know if it's controversial or not, because I've I've gotten on my podium quite a few times talking about... I don't think this movie is as bad as people make it out to be. I think people's expectations for this movie were just in the wrong spot. And that, of course, is Batman and Robin. As a continuation of the Burton era movies, they're bad. As an homage to the 60s Adam West Batman, they could not have been any better. Because, and we've talked about this before, the art style, the cinematography, the overall flair of the movie 
if you watch it back to back with the 60s 1966 Adam West movie, it actually feels like it almost could exist in the same universe. Um, I don't think Batman is and Robin is the worst comic book movie of all time. I think it's just misunderstood from the people that wanted something better. Um, that being said, I still think Batman and Robin has no irony here. One of the best Batman moments ever. And that's when Bruce thinks Alfred is dying. And we mm. have these real genuine heart to heart moments between Bruce and Alfred the likes of which we never actually seen before. Yes, Michael Caine and Christian Bale had some really good moments. Um, and I almost put Why Do We Fall on this from Batman Begins. But I actually think this is better because Bruce hasn't really had to have the opportunity to deal with death. He doesn't have to worry about that ever since his parents died. But having Alfred, who is the one constant in his entire life potentially die actually brings out this raw humanity and also george clooney's phoning it for most of batman and robin except in these scenes when he knows there's good material to work with the scenes with michael goff as um alfred they're just the best thing about batman and robin say what you want about the movie but the relationship between bruce and alfred in those specific scenes when he's comforting him at, at what might be his deathbed are really powerful and highlight that um the strong bond between Bruce and Alfred that I don't think a lot of other Batman movies have really touched on. They more try and make Alfred a comedic character. Yeah. And I, I, I get that. It's I'll, I, <laughs> Batman and Robin will show up a little bit later shortly. Um, but yeah, it's, it's easily one of the most powerful moments in Batman movie history. And it doesn't, there's not a lot that goes up against it. Now, my number nine <laughs> would you be surprised if there was a moment from dark knight rises on my on my list dark knight rises you said yes no because i think individually there's great moments i just maybe not connected super well fair enough so even though he makes us wait for it for 45 minutes the return slash debut of batman in dark knight rises is oh, so good um, I, I wanted to put the debut for, um, when Batman returns in the dark Knight returns, the animated movie, but I have that later. So, but like it, this has that same feel of you got the vet and the rookie in the car and the vet knows exactly what's about to go down. And he's like, kid, it's fine. Just back up. You're in for a show. This could be super cool. And the rookie's like, no, we got to do our cop thing. No, 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 no. And just all the Batman stuff ensues and you get to see some of the new gadgets and it, it just, it just felt like in a movie, at least for me, where sometimes I'm not a big, the biggest fan of the film, it felt fresh. It felt new. It was like, Oh yeah. It was like when, in ba you know, when Batman begins, when he forgets his first interrogation, the first, uh, that first scene in Batman begins where he's the, the, uh, the, uh, where were the other drugs the, going? Yeah, no, 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 not yet. Before that, where he's like being all scary and just like swooping down and scooping people up. And you know, the guy with the Uzi he's like, where are you? Here. <laughs> Great. Good stuff. It's like, it felt like that. I was like, Oh, yes we got batman let's go it was hard to not get excited for the rest of the film now for i guess also for, at least for me for dark knight rises the film that follows is not that great but it 45 minutes in making us wait for that it felt earned it felt like okay cool so he's been building to this for the you know for a good chunk of the movie now he gets to be Batman again, which is, I think, why I get so frustrated with the movie later when he just kind of like dips, you know? So uh, I'm glad you brought up Dark Knight Returns, because if I had to, my like my number like 11 or 12 just missed the cut was when he oh. comes back as Batman in Dark Knight Returns. And Alfred's like, when did you shave your mustache? And he like doesn't even notice that he shaved off his mustache getting ready to be Batman yeah. again. There's a couple yep. moments from Dark Knight Returns that just missed my cut of um, when he's fighting. Um, yeah, we got to make sure it's not in my list. Okay, because I know some stuff I was contemplating putting on my list, but I think I did cut them out of when he returns as Batman. Uh, the music is fantastic. Um, 
oh, what was it? What's the great line of this isn't a pit. It's just operating table and I'm the surgeon. Just, I know for a fact that's on Josh's list somewhere. Cause that's one of your Whoa, favorite moments what ever, you mean? but those just barely missed my cut, but I'm glad you brought up dark Knight returns. Um, <laughs> Josh, what would you say your number eight is? <laughs> Here we go with my Batman and Robin. <laughs> um, that's when I say shortly, I meant like right around the corner. Um, this is much less of a moment and much more of a thing that the nine that that Batman movie do- does. That's very, like you said, Adam West Batman. It's very sixty six. It's a the bat puns get me every time and I love them every time I see them and I will fight physically anybody that go, that disagrees because the bat bat credit card doesn't make sense, but it is okay. hilarious. No, no, I will fight you on the bat credit card for one reason. <laughs> bat. Okay. No joke. The bat credit card confused me so much as a kid because what does it say on the bat credit card? What does it say? Batman know. forever. <laughs> which is the movie before this. So I'm going, wait, which one is this? Mo- this is Batman and Robin then. Then why does his credit card say Batman forever? Shouldn't it be switched? Because Batman, f- it still bothers me to this day. It's such a weird nitpick, but I don't care. <laughs> oh, but the puns are so great. <laughs> uh, I used to see you. Uh, you guys need to chill. Like it's just, stay cool, bird boy. Dude, it's so good. A good pun, well delivered, deserves a good laugh. And I laugh most of Batman and Robin, not necessarily for the right reasons, but I'm here for it. So, what's you? What do you got for your number eight? My number eight is one that when this movie was announced, could have been really, really cheesy and dumb, like Batman and Robin. But when it ended up being is one of my favorite Batman movies ever made, no joke, because it combined two of my favorite things of all time. Batman and the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Oh, see, I let this off because I wanted to give it to you. Josh, what do you think this moment is for me? Um, okay, there's a good collection of them. There's Michelangelo Michelangelo's breakdown of who the Batman is. Um, which is oh, yeah. fantastic. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, there's, I mean, the turtles have a lot of great moments. Uh, but this but ain't I a top ten turtles list. It, yes, it, it, you're correct. I think it's the Batman Shredder Showdown. Ding, ding, ding! We have a winner. Because yeah. yeah. I go into this because I'm not gonna lie, Batman, uh, Batman versus. Is it Batman versus the Ninja Turtles or Batman and yes, the Ninja Turtles? I think it's versus. Um, yes, it is. Going into it, I was a little bit apprehensive because the animation style on paper seemed a bit more colorful, lighthearted, kid-friendly, which I, I had kind of been missing with the DC animated universe at that point being all the same. So I kind of like having a different art style, but also wasn't expecting brutal and intense violence because it kind of the animation style kind of disarms you for that of like oh it's bright and colorful holy crap that foot ninja just got a shuriken to the face um <laughs> and then when batman and shredder fight it's a fight that i didn't know i needed but i'm so glad it's in my life now because it's two of the best fighters from their respective worlds going at it and at a certain point even shredder's just like I can't even use my weapons here. This is too good of a fight. I truly want to know who the best is. Um, but also like at the end when Batman's like, I had a rematch with Shredder because Shredder is a man of honor. And I kind of like this honor among the fighters of just like, okay, you've truly beaten me. But also, like I said earlier, I wasn't expecting how brutal it was. Like there's a couple hits in the Batman Shredder fight that really make me wince because it sounds and looks so brutal, which is often hard to do in animation. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. But they really nailed it. And also, I don't really think any live-action movie has really nailed Batman's hand-to-hand combat necessarily well yet. Maybe Pattinson. Uh, But in terms of hand-to-hand combat, this is by far the best Batman fight yet. It was out-of-the-box... Almost everything about Batman versus the Ninja Turtles is just a win. But the Batman Shredder fight, it's the two best fighters from their perspective worlds. It's basically fantasy booking. 
and it worked to perfection. It was just wonderful. I loved it so much. Um, Oh, I just, you know, if you were talking about fantasy booking, I just, you know, I was wondering if this was something that you, uh, that you might pitch at some time. I don't know. We don't <laughs> like to pitch ideas around here. We don't like to fantasy book or anything. No, we don't. That's not something we do. Here. No, that's, that's, <laughs> no, nah, I don't see a future in that. Um, but yeah. my number no. seven, yeah. my number seven is one that I'm sure you'll be happy is on my list. But knowing you, you might have it on your list, but probably higher up. And that's from your boy, Terry McGinnis. <laughs> from Batman Beyond, Return of the Joker, which, Josh, you would probably know this better than me. I thought Return of the Joker was the only Batman Beyond movie they did, but they might have done another one that was like a movie. And by that, it was like three episodes put together on a DVD. Or was Return of the Joker the only one? Do you remember? As far as I'm aware, the Return of the Joker is the only one, yeah. Okay. So, um, I would say that the best thing about Batman Beyond Return of the Joker has to be the end fight with the Joker himself. Yes. Because we take an approach to Batman that we haven't seen before. Typically, Batman is like the stoic... I'm serious. I don't say anything during combat. I strike fear and intimidation. Whereas Terry McGinnis is a very different Batman as Batman Beyond to the point of uh, he hides in the shadows from Joker and he begins to taunt Joker. If he's just like, yeah, you never had this when you were working with Bruce, did you? He would always stay silent. You would make the jokes. Well, what happens if I make the jokes? Throws you off your game, doesn't it? You know, it's kind of sad. You're not even that funny. It's kind of pathetic, isn't it? And so it really gets in that mind of Joker, and it's just wonderful to see this, like, Batman getting the upper hand and out laughing the Joker, basically. And it's it's such a different take on Batman. It still counts for this because it's a Batman. Batman Beyond is still Batman. It's just a different... I like Batman tales that take different approaches to the Batman character. And... I think this was one of them of, okay, this Joker's different. We got to approach him differently. So let's embarrass him in a way that the original Batman probably wouldn't. Yeah. And weirdly enough, yeah, I I don't really have any moments from Return of the Joker on my list. However, (sighs) Terry is to this day still, I think, I think I might like Terry more than Bruce. That's all right. I like Dick as Batman more than Bruce. Yes, I mean that's not Dick to is negate. No, Bruce is probably like the third best Batman. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, um, and really after him, there's like Ezra, Azrael. So you know, Ew. there's that. But yeah, I know. <laughs> but let's talk about my number seven, which is a moment that I was not sure would uh, it. The moment I didn't think was going to exist because I didn't think the movie was going to be good. But I'm sure you've seen it. But if you haven't seen Justice League Dark, what are you doing? Go see it. It's hilarious. It's great. It's gritty. Um, But there's a moment in it in which Batman encounters beings called the Shrouds. Oh, okay. Okay. This is the moment. Okay. (laughs) <laughs> yes, who uh, the shrouds basically they hover around souls that are about to pass. Um, in the story that Constantine leads the team, he go Batman is, is involved. They go to go visit a friend, and there's some shrouds outside the house, signifying basically like oh, and Constantine voices this in that oh he you know the guy we're about to go see must be about to pass. He must be very sick. Um, and one of the shroud turns and kind of, j- you know, jibber jabs at, uh, at Constantine and kind of tries to be like, ah, we'll get you one of these days. And Batman kind of is like, what's he seeing? Blah, blah, blah. And the, the camera pans and bat- like, there's like four shrouds like surrounding Batman. And the, the, the line is, ah, yes, this one, he's escaped us many times. It vexes us. And, they get real close and Batman scares the crap out of them. And it's, it, it's a good moment. I'm never quite sure if he sees them, but I don't care because it's fantastic. 
it's basically Batman staring down Dementors from Harry Potter that represent death and just goes, boo, I ain't scared of you. Because Batman's yep. probably one of the only people that would actually yep. welcome death as opposed to stay alive. <laughs> um, my number six is probably one that's also pretty high on Josh's list from a movie that I absolutely hate. But oh? I'll give credit where credit's due. Of a good moment is a good moment. And to me, there is no better moment in Batman versus Superman than the warehouse fight. Basically, mm, that's Arkham crazy. Asylum and Arkham City combat personified into a movie. I said uh, in my Batman versus Shredder entry that no hand to hand combat has been better. That's because in the warehouse fight, it's kind of an amalgamation of some hand to hand, but mostly gadgetry combined with the hand-to-hand it wasn't solely hand-to-hand like we've seen batman be so he throws everything but the kitchen sink but he used the kitchen sink to hit superman instead um this scene is awesome however i i will say the ultimate cut of the ultimate edition is a more cohesive movie but i for this scene i would watch the theatrical cut because that at least confirms to me that these henchmen might still be alive whereas in the ultimate edition oh those fools are for sure dead because that guy's brain matters on the wall because Zack Snyder likes to (laughs) for Batman to kill people um yeah but this was the this was the type of the scene that we've been waiting for we kind of got it very very briefly in Batman Begins when he's training to be a ninja and at the beginning of the Roz fight when it's like three on one but we've never really gotten a good close quarter fight from batman before and if it was it was always like in close up so you can't really see that it's clearly not whoever it is this was wide shots clearly good hand-to-hand combat here and a lot of thought and effort that went into it i still don't like batman versus superman at all yeah but that warehouse fight that was pretty fire man (laughs) i'm upset that you just used the word fire i'm not at the same time at the same time, the warehouse fight is awesome, and that's why it's on my number six. Boom! Segue! <laughs> Bam! Rock on! Yeah, it's just, like you said, it's it's a good combination of hand-to-hand and uh, gadgetry, something we've never seen before. Um, outside of the brutality, uh, un- almost unnecessary brutality, um, it's the most Batman Batman we've ever Batmaned in a live action movie. So, I mean, I don't like BVS just like you, um, but it's, the, you can't deny that the, the scene is awesome. True. What is your number five, my friend? Oh, wait, 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 don't you have a number six? That was my number six. Ah, all right. No, hey, uh, what did so, you not uh, do? You no, I know we're, we're good. We're caught up. We're caught up. We're caught up. We're caught up. Hey, just, just in case anybody listening wants to doubt our how we, how good we are with numbers, um, <laughs> uh, I got my number five is the bat backup scene in Batman Begins. Do you oh. know what scene I'm referring to? Yes. Yeah. Yes. So bat backup, which <gasps> in re- retrospect is a terrible line, but at the same time, it's such a cool scene. It's again, it's. This was like the first real live action in Batman in a long time. And it's from somebody like Christopher Nolan. So we knew this wasn't going to necessarily have any aspect that was going to be for kids. And so that was really exciting. And then, but with that, there was a lot of stuff you thought you would never see. You would not, you thought you would never see Batman in the Batmobile. You thought you would never see Batman coming out of a cloud of bats, but the cloud of bats happens, and so does the Batmobile. Um, I love this scene. Batman's pinned down between the cops and a gang, and he needs to escape. And what better way than to call up, call in some backup? Hits the sonar on his boot, and just a cloud of bats just fills the building, and he escapes. And it's it's a really cool scene to see. Uh, when Batman uses bats. Cause I mean, it's not something weirdly enough that happens a lot in live action. I think I almost, I would almost be. It's the, that's like the only I time say that that's the only, that's the only time that that's ever happened in combat. It swirls him in the cave and Batman begins. And yeah, but 
they he, Nolan really hits them over the hits people over the head with the bat metaphor. So outside well, also, of almost as that's bad as from Catwoman. Batman Year One, which the movie was heavily based off of. Yes. Um, so I'm so glad you brought up Batman Begins because there's a lot of different scenes that I could have gone with, but the scene in yes, question absolutely. is uh, the one that I went with at least is the scene that immediately follows the one that you just brought up. So track with me in Batman Begins. He gets the bat swarm, but then he calls, I got my car. I got mine. Yours. The tumbler comes out and ensues mm-hmm. one of the best car chases in Batman history. Say what you want about the tumbler being a full on tank. I'm glad that the new Pat, the new Battinson Batmobile is not a full on tank yet because I would like a more sports car approach for the time being. We've had enough tanks, but good grief is that tumbler sexy and that tumbler chase scene. I appreciate you could tell that it was a practical stunt. Like, um, if I remember right, that car could go like 45 or 60 miles an hour. Like that's mm-hmm. a fully functioning car and you could tell like the U-turn that it does, uh, weaving in and out. I love the moment when, um, he's being trailed by a helicopter and a couple of cops and all of a sudden, just like that, he goes dark and they can't see him. It's like, how? But okay. Um, this is that Tumblr chase. Thing. I'm not normally yeah. a big car chase person. I think they're just, eh, they don't really get my adrenaline pumping. That one does, because there's a ticking clock for Rachel. Rachel! Uh, which <laughs> just becomes a meme in and of itself. But that Tumblr chase, great vehicle. Does it come in black? The, that classic line. Just everything about that Tumblr chase scene, getting Rachel back to the back, keeping time. Just chef's kiss. Honorable mention, though, for Batman yeah. Begins of the elevator ride of why do we fall? So we can learn to pick ourselves up. You still haven't given up on me? I, Never. Yeah. I love, I love Batman Begins. Um, I I think, I mean, it's not hard for me to rank them Dark Knight, Batman Begins, or, and then Rises. But even I think people that like Rises would put Batman Begins still ahead of Rises because it, it does so much right. It reintroduces you to Batman without beating it over your head. And it has a lot of, really cool moments that you never thought you'd see on in a live action mo- movie. Um, we as far are, as Batman uh, movies, as far as a straight Batman adaptation, Batman begins mm-hmm. is leaps and bounds better than dark Knight. I still think dark Knight is the better movie and I, it's more impactful in my own life, but Batman begins is one of the, I think it gets overlooked because of dark Knight, but Batman begins, I think is the better all around Batman movie. Yeah. Oh yeah. And I, I see, and I, I don't think you can even argue that either. Um, so we're going to go, speaking of the dark Knight, I'm already hitting it because unfortunately we're in the top four now and Mm -hmm. stuff gets really, really, really tough to start to pick apart and stuff like that. Um, so my number four, there's a lot like, like we said about Batman against, there's a lot of moments to choose from. I'm going to go with the car chase scene. Um, right up into uh, into the line where where Joker is shooting the gun uh shooting um Batman while he's ch- coming like for straight form he's like I want you to do it I want you to do it I want you to do it I love that entire scene I I feel that it's it's a different part of Batman that we don't see often. Like I know you and I always beg for the detective stuff because we don't really get that. And we beg for the hand to hand because we don't really get that. But something that I think dark Knight does well, specifically in that scene is Batman, Batman's resourcefulness. And then also his, at the end of the day, his steadfast stance upon his, his, I'm going to put large air quotes on this, uh, his rule, um, he abides by that he, rule a lot better than some other ones. <laughs> Affleck. Yeah, no, I know. And that that's, I think I put air quotes there. Cause you can always make an argument that like a- Affleck's Batman legitimately kills people. There's moments in the comics he shoots where he him down. Batman kills people. Yeah. So here's the, at the end of the day, Nolan and Christopher Bale, C- Christian Bale's, um, Batman does his best to stick to his one rule primarily because that's kind of what dark Knight revolves around. 
but I love the intensity of that scene of Batman charging into a situation where he knows he might have to break his rule, but he doesn't want to, but he knows it's necessary, but he just can't. And Joker takes advantage of that. And I feel like that's storytelling wise. That's one of the biggest moments we could have in the, at least in that series. So you want to know something shocking, Josh? What's up? I don't have a single moment from the dark Knight on my list. Really? Not a one. And here's why. The Dark Knight is not a Batman movie. It's a Joker movie. Fair enough. I was looking at this going, Dark Knight's great. Is there a single Batman moment to me that really stands out? No, not really. I'm not going to... Almost every iconic scene that I think of for the Dark Knight involves the Joker more than anything else. Or it's like the fairy scene where it's... One of the fairies going to blow up the other one? Like, almost everything I think about with the Dark Knight doesn't involve Batman. Um, or, like, Rachel blowing up. Oh. That was Batman not being there type of thing. Um, whereas number my number four is one of my favorite uh, Batman animated movies of all time. Number two, probably. And my number one will never be replaced. Uh, my number two favorite DC animated movie of all time Batman Under the Red Hood. And it's the one scene that I see every couple months make the rounds on like Twitter and Instagram. It's like, this is the best Batman scene and explains his one rule. And it's the scene where Jason has captured the Joker and he's just like, can we kill him? Not because um, he's killed. Uh, not don't even remember all the graveyards that he's filled, but kill him because he took me away from you. And Batman's just like, if I allow myself to go down to that place, I'll never come back. And it's basically just like the perfect summation of, yes, Zack Snyder, this is why Batman does not kill no one. He doesn't kill anybody. And Jason's about to kill uh, Joker but Batman always has one trick up his sleeve and he finds a way out of it. It's There's a lot about Under the Red Hood that I could have put on my list. Batman and Nightwing teaming up together to fight Amazo is just with the best Neil Patrick Harris performance ever. Fight me. Um, but just that end <laughs> credits of I would still love one day to get an Under the Red Hood movie more than anything else except for maybe Court of Owls. But that's just a perfect summation of why Batman is who he is and even... With, like, the death of Jason, who, let's be honest, Jason didn't get interesting as a character until he died, but whatever. Um, that no matter what, he still doesn't kill people, or at least doesn't mow them down with machine guns. You know what's great? Is that your number that's four? That's a fantastic scene. That is such a great scene. And that's why it's my number three. <laughs> Gosh dang it! Oh, uh, I, I love that, cl- that whole, I, in my notes, I put the, cl- the whole climax of Into the Red Hood, because out under the, the moment, Red Hood, not Into the Red Hood. I'll say what I want. That's um, like a prequel movie. <laughs> I love, like, from the beginning of that scene when Batman comes into the room to the point where he pulls jason's body out of the rubble and joker's nowhere to be found uh it is un i am how do i describe this it is so hard to tear myself away from that scene because the drama the whole movie's been building to this and because of um what is jared eccles jensen eccles that does the voice of jensen eccles jensen sorry um he because of his vo- vocal performance you feel everything that jason's going going through it's not that the joker killed him it's not that the batman moved on it's that he feels like batman doesn't care about him because joker's still alive like i thought if you truly loved me like you always said that you would that he would not be around and it's it really it's enthralling to watch. It's something that is going to be incredibly difficult to to uh, adapt and to bring into live action. But honestly, like you, bring it on. 
I would love to see someone take the challenge and cause it's easily one of the most heart wrenching and emotional stories that Batman has to offer. So something I haven't even thought about until just now is I think another reason why this story hits so hard is it's more or less Batman's decision not to kill coming back to bite him in the butt of maybe if I killed Joker mm-hmm. a long time ago, Jason would still be alive to this day. Um, but then that raises the whole question of if he started killing sooner, maybe Dick would have left him sooner. There's a whole bunch of like different side questions mm-hmm. you can ask about this, but I think it's just under the red hood is such a great story about like, even with this, even when your mistakes come back to bite you in the butt, do you still stick to your beliefs? And Batman does. And I, Oh, it's just so good. Uh, so that's your number three. What was your number four, Josh? Number four was, um, I want you to, do, I want you to do it. Oh, okay. And then your number three was, uh, was We're that good with numbers? <laughs> We're so good with numbers. We're so good. Um, what's your number three, bro? We're so good with numbers. In fact, that my number three is a number 89 from Batman 89. Okay. Okay. While not my favorite Batman, there is one moment that is forever etched in pop culture and while it might not even be the best version of this line, it has such a long-lasting impact. I'm Batman. When Michael mm. Keaton says that for the first time. Mm. I still prefer the Christian Bale one when he's interrogating Falcone. Okay, let's settle this once and for all. Josh, is it Falcone or Falcone? It's Falcone. I think it's I think it's Falcone. No, I'm... A hundred percent sure it's Falcone. Every single movie that I can off the top of my head, at least I know in Christopher Nolan's, it's all Falcone. I, I know that in not bad blood in, um, I actually, I want to say in, in red hood, it's Falcone. I, where are you hearing Falcone? I, I think there's a, like an animated movie or two that they might've said Falcone. Or maybe it was like an audio book. But I've heard some people call it Falcone. It's not to the level of Ra's al Ghul versus Ra's al Ghul level debate. But there's at least some debate with Falcone versus Falcone. Um, but w- we'll see what Matt Reeves approaches it. Because we've got John Turturro as Carmine this time around. Um, like I said, I like Christian Bale's I'm Batman more. But the Michael Keaton one firmly established, okay, this ain't your old man's Adam West 66 Batman anymore. While the whole movie is not my favorite Batman movie, I understand and respect its place in history, and the scene leading up to it is wonderful. Of the two crooks on the roof, they think they're safe, and they see more or less a horror movie slasher villain in the background swoop down, then all of a sudden he's not there anymore, they shoot him, he stands up just like a boogeyman. It's Batman striking fear into his opponents like never before that we had never seen up until that point, but that was... Purely and simply Batman and Batman from that from that point on was just never the same. And I think we owe a lot to 89, even if it's not the best Batman. I think that scene in particular owes a lot to the Batman legacy, and it's still one of the best Batman scenes ever. I would agree. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I've never really been as you can kind of see from my list so far. I'm not. I don't really have a lot of attachment to the old school Batmans. Uh, Adam West, because I don't know why I, ha- I I enjoy it. I think it's kooky. I think it plays to my sense of humor. But like Val Kim- Kilmer's, Michael Keaton, and uh, George Clooney, like those Batman, I've never really got any sort of attachment to them. Mainly, probably I didn't grow up with them, so I didn't. I, I, my first live action Batman movie was Batman Begins. So take that with as you will. Um, you ready to go d- dive into number twos? Let's do it, man. Cool. So I have a feeling that this is your number one. Um, but if you haven't seen Batman Bad Blood yet. Nope, um, nope, nope. It's not. Oh, okay, 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 okay. I don't have Bad uh, Blood. Really? Okay. All right. Um, well then I'm going to go into it then because the fight that towards the end of the movie between Batman and, and Nightwing, Ooh, my is heart, my heart wrenching, my heart, oh, my goodness. Okay. 
Uh, before you go into it, I think the only reason why this isn't on my list is because I think Young Justice did it better. Fair. But that also is a show and had more time to develop it. But back to what you were saying about Bad Blood, which is criminally underrated and it's wonderful and I love it. It's like it's the one movie that made me like Damien. And I no, hate... I like Damien in Apocalypse War. No, 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 you didn't. You're a liar. What? <laughs> I'm a, you're a liar. I, I did good. like Apo- no, he is not good until this movie. I didn't say that. I said I like Damien in Apocalypse War. But as a character, I liked I Damien as a character in Apocalypse War, not before it. All right. All right. I'll let you have it. I'll let you have it. Because you and I have talked about it before. We hated Damien, but Apocalypse War completed his arc so perfectly. But also, he's a different character in that. True. Um, yeah. I didn't like him before that, but in Apocalypse War, I liked him. And it kind of made me appreciate him in the previous movies more. But he's still. He's not my least favorite Robin. That's Jason. By far, but yeah, he's still nah. he see, got nothing on Dick. I think a lot because of Bad Blood, because of Judas Contract, a lot of the new Teen Titans movies that are coming out. Um, I I have come to love Damien. However, we're not here for Damien. We're here for the Batman Nightwing fight that has been so long coming, and in a lot of ways, they build it throughout the movie because. Batman's gone. Somebody's got to take over. And, and literally everyone's looking at Dick and Dick's like, nah, dude, it's, it ain't me. You looking for somebody else. And it just builds and builds and builds and builds and builds to the point where a brain, a mind controlled Batman has to fight Dick. So I like that fight for the most part, but I think I do like bad Blood for the most part, but I think, I'm a little too close to Bad Blood because, like a lot of the other animated ones, it's kind of loosely based on a specific story, but also is based on several stories combined. And this one was based off of Battle for the Cowl, in which case Batman's gone or out of commission and there's a fight to see who takes over. Battle for the Cowl is one of my favorite Nightwing stories ever, and I like that story a lot better than what they did in Bad Blood because I think Bad Blood, they rushed it, but also introduced characters that really either didn't need to be there or didn't make sense to be there like why was i liked batwoman in bad blood but why was she never seen again (laughs) like Uh, that is the one and only movie and also you set up batgirl at the end of that and it was awesome also only seen in hush really quick and that's it um yeah like was the left hand not knowing what the right hand was doing there but um, I yeah, I don't know. But hey, you know what? Now with uh, Justice League Apocalypse Dark, we've got a new, uh, a new little uh, little uh, uh, canvas to work with. So um, Superman, Man of Tomorrow, man, Man of Tomorrow might be in a new universe, or might be um, its own separate thing, which I want more actually. Yes, but I think the thing that the reason the scene sticks out so much is that a lot of it ha- has Nightwing. I'm going to use the word pleading because he, 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 with, with Bruce, because on a certain level, Batman is physically better than Nightwing. Emotionally and mentally, I think Nightwing is so, Dick is so much more mature and so much more capable oh, yeah. of, of being a better superhero, being a better Batman. And that becomes obvious here to the point that, does he break both Nightwing's arms or just one? He breaks he breaks at least one of them. Yes. But like it's it is heartbreaking to watch because Batman Bruce is not responding, but Dick is literally laying his heart out while fighting for his life. And it it's dude, it's some of the best Batman that I I don't read a lot. Um so uh, comics wise, so it was uh, it was something really cool to see come up into onto screen. Anytime Dick is put into prominence, I'm a fan of. Also, with these like the what was the current, but now it's expired. They had some guy named I think his name was Sean Mayer or Sean Mar Mar as Nightwing, and I never really liked that voice actor. Um, he's very one note. 
Uh, he got better over time, like a lot of the voice actors in the animated universe, except for Jason Amara, who, even in Just League Apocalypse War, wasn't a fan of his Batman at all. Um, but yeah, Bad Blood it has to be up there. Um, it's a love-hate relationship for me, mostly love. You have a love-hate relationship with my number two, Dark Knight okay. Rises. God, no! <laughs> However, before you get all mad... Not only is this the best moment in Dark Knight Rises, it's probably what I will say is probably the best scene in the entire Dark Knight trilogy, and honestly is what the trilogy was leading up to, and it's like the culmination of Bruce's story. And that's when Bane throws Batman into the pit. And he has to claw and climb his way out without using the rope. Because it's not very subtle in its allegory, of the well that Bruce fell in as a kid, but I love the metaphor that comes with it of Batman never, Bruce never got out of the well mentally um, when he fell in in Batman Begins. He was still the afraid child, and that was only exacerbated when his parents died. He was still the frightened little kid dressed up in a black bat suit. Um, so in Dark Knight Rises, he actually has to bring himself out of that. He has to heal himself, basically. Oh, interesting. He has to heal himself and not just, you know, somebody slapping his spine back into place. Um, he has to f- heal physically, but he also has to heal emotionally. And only doing that and putting the rope aside, putting, you know, the safety and what he knows he can fall back on a side to truly move on and take that leap to the next step. Also, the more I watch it, he really easily makes that jump. And I'm just going, how did Noah make that jump before he had like two or three feet to go still on that jump? He's, he seemed fine, but, um, yeah, I think that pit scene in dark Knight rises while the movie may have its issues. And I still wonder how he got back to America. Um, that pit scene is just a perfect end cap to the entire Dark Knight trilogy and really sums up the overall themes of it and the theme of Batman. Okay. I'm with you. I'm with you. All right. So uh, now's the time, folks. It's time for our number one favorite Batman moments of all time. Nathan, are you ready? Huh? Are you ready, my friend? I'm never ready. ha. <laughs> Um, so I don't think you're going to be surprised <laughs> that Dark Knight Returns Part 1 is is my number one. Is it the uh, operating table? Yeah, boy. You don't get it, boy. This isn't a mud hole. It's an operating table. And I'm the surgeon. Ah, it freaks the I thought you were about to do the Roman Reigns hand thing. Oh, my gosh. It's so cool. Uh, it's The big thing is that fight and it's a big reason why i think that part one is way better than part two it um, is definitely the fact i don't really like what they do with the whole uh batman superman stuff um despite it being fairly accurate um i like part one better because it is unlike rises a successful tale of Batman fighting his way back to being his his old self again. He's like, you know what? <sighs> Gotham needs me. I can't. I can't. I can't not do this. Oh, I. How? When did I shave my mustache? I guess I'm Batman again. To the point of like, he's fighting. What is his name? The mutant. Um, Super- mutant. Like there's a. Like, like the boss. I think yeah, it's, it's like, like a mutant leader. Yeah, I forget. But he. He's like fighting him for the first time. And when Alfred is like, dude, get out of there. He is going to kill you. He's like, no, I have to know. I have to know that I'm young again. And he gets his butt whooped. And then the rest of the movie becomes him fighting back and him building himself up to the point where he understands who he is again to the point where you're like, yeah, man, you may be, be bigger than me. You may be tougher than me, but I'm Batman. And Sorry, dude, but this is a, not a mud hole. It's an operating table. And this arm of yours, it's mine, and it's coming off because I'm a certain. Ah! Oh, gosh, it's such a good moment. So, 
um, we have what we have, like our little jars. Josh has like his how to train your dragon jar. I have my yeah. iron giant. We both could share a warrior jar. Yes. Um, another jar that I feel I need because it's my number one. Wait, can I call it? Can I call it? You probably know the movie. I don't know if you know the scene, though. Let's I see. don't know the scene. I know it's from Mask of the Fat Phantasm. It has to be. Obviously, it's me we're it talking about be. here. <laughs> I mean, it, if it's still the best Batman episode, movie. Without talking about it, I would have been upset. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I have to save it for for, for number one. I of course, oh, absolutely. Um, because I hadn't watched it in a while. Heather was like, "We should watch Mask of the Phantasm." I'm just going. There you go. Because we've been watching a whole bunch of DC stuff this week just because we're getting ready for fandom, and that's just how we roll in this household. Um, but, of course, I have to talk about Mask of the Phantasm for best Batman scene of all time, to the point that I've actually done its own solo video on this movie with a couple minutes just devoted to this one scene. So the scene in question is um, Batman has just proposed to his girlfriend, Andrea Beaumont, which, um, side tangent, can we please get a Mask of the Phantasm adaptation in the Matt Reeves trilogy? Please? I would love that. Um, just end credits for the new Batman. Your angel of death awaits. Oh, just... <clears throat> um, but Bruce has uh, um, proposed to his girlfriend, Andrea Beaumont, and she says yes. Uh, next day, he's investigating this cave where a whole bunch of bats came out. He comes out, and Alfred gives him back the ring that Andrea gave him. Um, and we find out later why she's left him. Um, but basically... His one route of happiness is completely gone. And something that I never noticed until this most recent rewatch, the scene does not transition from um, his sadness of getting the ring back directly to the cave. There's one quick shot, but I think that shot tells a thousand words. And that is um, we fade out from him getting the ring back to a picture of Thomas and Martha Wayne hang, hung over the fireplace, and then we transition to the cave of Bruce has lost the one thing left that would have possibly brought him to the route that his parents were on of true happiness and abandoning the Batman dream that he's had for a while to avenge the death of his parents. He has lost the one motivation that was keeping him on the true and narrow path. There's a great scene early in the movie that also could be an honorable mention of he's at his parents' tomb crying out, going, I didn't expect this to happen. I didn't expect to be happy. It's different now. It has to be different now. He doesn't want to be Batman. Well, now that his happiness is gone and has been ripped away from him, he has no choice but to go to the darkness and literally turn his back on the happiness that his parents had in order to fulfill the mission that he promised to them that was established earlier. So we don't even get clear face of Batman. We get Bat um, Alfred in the background, but he's suiting up for the first time in perfect silhouette. We don't even see anything. The music swells. Shirley Jackson with her epic music. Um, he just reaches out his hand for Alfred to give him the mask. He puts on the mask. He's finally Batman. Again, we don't see anything. We just see a close-up of his eyes. He turns around, and Alfred is terrified. The music swells even more. It's just, my God. Bruce Wayne at this point now is dead. There's only Batman, and it scares Alfred. That is the Batman I know and love of. He had happiness. He threw it away, and he's gone down this mission now. No scene to me has ever encapsulated everything that's great about Batman of He's had this great pain. Now he's using that pain to help other people by just scaring the living daylights out of everybody. And I've always liked the idea of he's supposed to scare people. So wouldn't Alfred be scared the first time he sees him? That's how he knows he's accomplished what he set out to do. If he's scaring the person that he trusts the most and he knows the best, then he knows he's scary and he's going to just terrify everyone. I just... That scene is masterful. I think a big part of that is Shirley Walker's fantastic music. Um, but just that scene in general is so, so well done. And it's Mask of the Phantasm as a whole is a masterpiece. Also has the best Joker laugh of all time when everything's going up in flames and Joker's realize that he might actually die and he just lets out a death cackle and it's terrifying and wonderful. But guys, Mask of the Phantasm is on Netflix now. Go and watch it. You can thank me later. <laughs> yeah, I uh, 
when I said Bad Blood uh, should be on your, your number one, I completely forgot, and I don't know why, forgot about your love for Mask of the Ta- Phantasm. So come on, I, I, it's I, not I think like I bring it up every up. other week. I know, right? Um, but yeah, dude, like the the thing about Batman is he continuously surprises us, and there's always an adaptation that tries to do something new. Um, it's why we get all of these moments. It's why we get recurring characters. It's why there's such a love for the character. Does he have issues? Yes. Are there issues with the character itself? Of course. (laughs) Oh yeah. But at the end of the day, I, I think the idea that you touched on the idea that he takes his pain and he wants to help people with it is very admirable and something that I don't think some other comic book characters do. Hmm. Not calling out anybody names. Um, but well, what do you guys think? What are some of your all time favorite Batman movie moments? Let us know in the comments below. We always love hearing from you guys. And as always, if you like what you hear and you want to hear more, subscribe to us on whatever audio platform you're listening to us on, but that's iTunes, Spotify, Google podcasts, or YouTube. And if you haven't already subscribe to us on YouTube at uncharted media. And as always, Stay sharp, movie guys and gals.